Hi, I'm Lauren Uncleese Klein, staff attorney here at Children's Law Center, and I'm going to be talking to you about the due process hearing, an overview of the whole process, practice tips, and litigation skills. Um, so we're going to start off just by talking in generally about the due process hearing. Due process hearing um, is the name for the litigation process for a special education case. And special education cases are litigated administratively. Independent hearing officers are contracted to hear all petitioner claims. In D.C., the hearing officers are contracted by the Office of the State Superintendent for Education, but they are not employed by the Office of the State Superintendent of Higher Education. They are, for all intents and purposes, independent. Um, in D.C., the hearing officers directly control most aspects of the case management of your hearing. They control scheduling. They're going to control um, whether a continuance can be granted if it's no longer than 10 business days. They're going to control things like admitting evidence, uh, certifying witnesses, general, general hearing management, um, ruling on motions, and of course they're going to determine remedy. Due process hearings are on a relatively quick timeline. They are from the date of filing until the date of your hearing officer decision, no more than 75 days. So when looking at how those 75 days break down, we're going to consider day one to be the day that you file your complaint. So when you look at day one as the day your, file, your complaint has been filed, 10 calendar days after that point, you should receive an answer from the respondent. 15 calendar days from that day one, from the day that you have filed, you have the deadline, or you and the school system have the deadline to hold a dispute resolution session. Um, that session can be waived by both of the parties, um, but if not waived, it has to happen within 15 days of filing. The first 30 days after you file the complaint are considered under the law to be the resolution time period. The first 15 days are when you're supposed to have the dispute resolution period. The next 15 days, the law contemplates you and the school system going back and forth to try and resolve the complaint. However, this time period can also be waived by both of the parties. So if, for example, you and the school system sit down to a dispute resolution session, you're not able to resolve the complaint, and both parties agree that there is no chance of a resolution, you can both agree to waive the remaining days left in your 30-day resolution period and just move forward to scheduling the hearing. So. 45 days, and this is 45 calendar days, after the resolution period ends. And of course, remember, that could either be 30 days after you file or the day that you and opposing counsel decide that there is no further chance of resolution. 45 days after that point is when the hearing must be held and a hearing officer decision must be issued. So that all must take place in the next 45 days. As a subcategory of that 45-day timeline, and we'll go over this a little bit later in the presentation, but I just want to flag it for you, that five business days before the start of the hearing is when you and the respondent will exchange documents, and that's sort of the disclosure due date is what that's often called. So again, the total can be up to 75 days from the date of filing, which is about 11 weeks. Um, the, hearing off, the hearings can also be expedited. Um, hearings can be expedited in one of three ways. One is there's an automatic application of an expedited timeline when a disciplinary matter is the main issue um, involving the child or when the child is, for example, currently suspended or expelled. Um, but hearings can also be expedited when the physical or emotional health or safety of the student, him or herself, or other students is in danger or any other substantial justification. These last two, there's not a lot of case law that delineates what reaches that threshold and they are thresholds that are different depending on the hearing officer that you might be working with. Um, from the date that you file a motion for an expedited hearing, the hearing officer must rule within five business days from that date. So if you file a due process complaint and at the same time you file a motion for an expedited hearing, 
then the hearing officer has five business days to either grant your motion for expedited hearing or deny it. The expedited timeline cuts the time about in half. So day one, again, counts as the day that you file the complaint. Within seven calendar days of the day you file the complaint, the school system has to set up the dispute resolution session with the parent. Um, however, the school system or the respondent still has 10 days in order to file their response to your complaint. Within 20 school days of filing, and this is different, this is not 20 calendar days, it's 20 school days of filing, the hearing must be held. And within an additional 10 school days after the hearing is held, the hearing officer decision must be issued. This means that it is about six to seven weeks under an expedited hearing time frame from the date that you file to the date that you would be getting your hearing officer decision. And that assumes that you file your motion for an expedited hearing right at the beginning and that it takes the hearing officer anywhere from one to five business days in order to respond. So what do you need um, before you file? Well, you need a bunch. Um, you need to, number one, understand the legal issues that are involved in your case. Um, you want to know the facts that support each of your issue, and you want to know the facts that might harm your case. It's really important to see where your trouble spots may lie and to see the weaknesses in your case so that you can make sure that you bolster those during your prep. Um, you also want to plan for how you're going to carry the burden on your issues at hearing. And that means you want to have a sense of what documents you're going to be using, what witnesses you're going to be calling, and whether or not you want to utilize experts as part of your case in chief. Um, depending on your case posture, as has been discussed in other training segments, you will have had varying degrees of contact with folks at the school, so you will have varying levels of knowledge of what information they possess and what things they might bring to the table, but those are all part of what you will be doing as part of your assessment for the strengths and the weaknesses of your case. Now, using experts, um, because the parent carries the burden, uh, we often tend to use experts in our cases, and there's lots of different kinds of experts that can be used to make your case. You can use psychologists who are often evaluators, um, educational consultants. You can use speech language, occupational therapy, physical therapy providers who are outside of the school, um, psychiatrists, counselors. One thing to know, so an educational consultant is somebody who has a lot of knowledge of how it is to work in a school serving children with disabilities, and they're folks who can really help you to um, look at what's going on for your student and see what might need to be in place to help that student access their education and progress. Um, some of the reasons you might want to retain an expert is because, of course, the parent has the burden of proof um, or the petitioner has the burden of proof. And in DC, the parents are often the petitioner. Um, sometimes an expert opinion is necessary to prove some of the issues you're raising in your case. Um, and Experts can help explain to a hearing officer in a way that other lay witnesses may not be able to explain really what's going on with the child. What does the constellation of needs of that child mean for that child in an academic setting? What does it mean for them academically, functionally, socially? Um, and they're also the ones who are going to discuss often proposed remedies and why that remedy might be appropriate for the child. So you want to think about if you're going to use an expert, and also when you might retain the expert. Do you want to retain an expert before you file? Do you want to retain an expert after you filed? Um, if you do retain an expert after you filed, we certainly recommend you do it shortly after you filed, since the time frame is so compressed uh, for these cases. Expert costs vary um, depending on the expert, depending on the area, and depending on the amount of work you're really expecting the expert to do. Um, Within pro bono cases with CLC, the expectation is that if a firm decides to take on an expert, um, in one of our cases that the firm will bear the cost of that expert, and the costs can range from $5,000 to $10,000, really, again, depending on the expert, depending on what they do, because it can involve a, a large amount of work. It can involve preparing for and attending meetings. It can involve looking through documents, writing a report. Um, assessing a child, and then the preparation for and actual testimony during a due process hearing. Um, 
You can also utilize as experts evaluators, and sometimes evaluators end up getting funded. Uh, you learned in some of the other training modules about independent educational evaluations that are funded by the school system. Um, and these are the IEEs that are authorized by the LEA and are paid at a fixed rate by the local education agency. However, sometimes the local education agency rates are fairly low and good evaluators may not accept those rates and sometimes there might be an opportunity to make up the difference um, between what an evaluator would normally charge and what the school system will reimburse for. Um, evaluators will also additionally tend to charge extra for testimony during a due process hearing and the hourly rates for testimony vary widely. Um, when you look at the rules that are governing due process hearings, um, you're going to look at a variety of sources. So you're going to find these sources in the U.S. Code, in the CFR, in the D.C. Municipal Regulations. You're also going to look to see um, OSSI, the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. They are going to have a hearing officer standard operating procedures manual. Um, what we want to flag for you is at the time of taping, this manual has a number of updates that have not been integrated into the manual. We provide you copies within the CLC materials. You can also find them on Aussie's website. But what's really crucial is that you look at both the standard operating procedure document, but then look through all of the updates that have been provided for the standard operating procedure manual because they have not actually been integrated into the manual itself. For example, there have been two separate updates to the rules for expedited hearings. Both of those you'd be expected to know about. Neither of them have been placed into the actual standard operating procedure. They have been released as part of a policy bulletin. Um, and those are all, again, in the CLC materials you receive from us. They are also on the web. The other thing we wanted to make sure that um, folks who are watching this know is that though at this time, the standard operating procedures have not been integrated into the DC regulations. We've been informed that that will be happening soon. And when that does happen, we'll be sure to update you. So now that you have all that information, you move on to actually filing the complaint. Um, and so the question is, who can file? Of course, the parent can file. Um, and the parent is the parent as defined by law. So it can be a parent, it can be a guardian, it can be a surrogate parent. Um, and they can, they can file complaints regarding any matter involving the denial of FAPE and their child. Um, and they can file against a number of folks. Um, they can file against the local education agency that the child currently attends. They can file against a local education agency that the child used to attend because remember, particularly in DC, we have a lot of different LEAs here. We have the DC public schools, we have charter schools that act as their own LEAs. We have charter schools that act, that DCPS acts as the charter's LEA. And so you might be filing against multiple LEAs in one complaint because a child has attended multiple schools um, during the time period that you are writing on in your complaint. Um, the other folks who can file complaints are the LEA themselves, can file against a parent um, for a variety of reasons. One is when a parent refuses to allow the school system to evaluate a child or if they refuse to allow the school system to provide services to a child. Um, the, the school system is also legally required to sue a parent if a parent has requested an independent educational evaluation and the school district thinks that they did the right evaluation. They have two choices in that situation, generally. The two choices are, one, provide funding without unnecessary delay for that IEE, or two, sue the parent. However, in D.C., the local education agencies rarely, if ever, sue the parent, even when legally required to do so. Um, the other person who can file is, of course, the student, him or herself, if the student is over the age of 18 and has maintained the educational decision-making authority. So parents file in a wide range of situations, um, but they file when a local education agency has failed to, for example, identify the child, provide appropriate services to the child, evaluate the child timely or appropriately, um, whether they failed to 
even write an IEP or write an appropriate IEP or implement an IEP, um, or whether the school district has failed to act at all in any capacity. The parents can also file against the state education agency. And again, in DC, that's OSSI, the Office of the State Superintendent for Education. And parents can sue the state education agency, for example, um, if the state education agency fails to approve an appropriate placement that a charter school has said that they want to move the child into. All of those require Aussie state level sign off. If the state refuses to sign off on that, you can sue them as well. For example, providing records. If the state agency actually has some of the records and they're not providing it, you can sue on that as well. <clears throat> the contents of the complaint are laid out in the law and also Aussie does provide a template that we have also provided in the CLC materials and is also on Aussie's website. Um, however, just to review what should be on the complaint, because you don't have to use the template, but it should always include the name, the address, um, the school of the child, the schools that are being named in the complaint, the LEAs, the SEAs. Um, you want a description of the problem that includes supporting facts. You want to look at the issues the remedy that's known at the time of filing. You want to make sure to mention whether you want to do mediation, um, whether you are, even at the point of filing, waiving your right to a resolution session, thinking that perhaps there's no way you're going to be able to resolve it, so you want to not waste time going to a resolution session. You want to estimate the amount of time that you are going to use to present your case in chief. And you want to make sure to bring up any accommodations that your parent, your client, might need. And these accommodations can include things like a wheelchair accessible room, but also include things like an interpreter for a parent who doesn't speak English as a first language, who, for example, is deaf. Um, you can request those things, and that's all part of the complaint. Then, of course, you and or your parent will sign the complaint. Though in D.C., uh, or in federal law and in D.C. law, you don't have to plead with particularity there are mechanisms for the respondent to challenge the sufficiency of a complaint. Um, when you challenge a sufficiency, um, the hearing officer has five days to rule on that challenge to the sufficiency of the complaint. However, it's very important that if there is no sufficiency notice provided from the respondent regarding the sufficiency of your complaint, then there should be no finding of insufficiency. Essentially, the hearing officers should not be sua sponte making decisions on the sufficiency of the complaint unless there has been a notification that the respondent thinks the complaint is insufficient. However, different hearing officers feel differently about this, and some hearing officers do sua sponte make decisions regarding sufficiency. The one thing to remember is that if there has been a notice of sufficiency and the hearing officer has five days to respond to that notice of sufficiency. There's no time built in there for you to have a right to respond. So if you want to respond, you must do so quickly before the hearing officer comes up with their decision on the sufficiency of the complaint. There's also in federal law and state law here in DC, statute of limitations um, on IDEA claims. The statute of limitations can be found in two separate places, but both places lay out that the alleged violation must occur, must not have occurred more than two years beyond the date that the parent knew or should have known of the issues underlying the complaint. Um, there are statutory exceptions to this. One is the LEA's specific misrepresentation that they solved the issues underlying the complaint. And the other is the LEA, the local education agency, withholding information that would be important for the parent um, to even know that they needed to file a complaint. The bars for these are very high. Um, the case law is fairly complex, and you are always welcome to reach out to your CLC mentor if you're coming up against a statute of limitations issue in order to figure out where the lay of the land is on that um, locally. The other, issue, the other um, exceptions to the statute of limitations are found in case law, the continuing violation doctrine and equitable tolling. Now, continuing violation doctrine has, in most cases, um, been disputed in terms of whether it applies to IDEA cases. However, there are some areas where it's not in dispute that it does apply. And that is to say that it is applicable, still um, strongly applicable in limited situations. So for example, if you have a, a client whose child was evaluated in 2006 
when there was no reevaluation in 2009, when the triennial should have been evaluated, and it's now 2012, that violation, the failure to conduct triennials, remains. It's not that that, that that complaint or that particular issue disappeared after 2009 because it's beyond the scope of the statute of limitations and because continuing violation doctrine wouldn't apply. In that case, because there's a continuing violation to fail to evaluate, the continuing violation does in fact apply. So when you fill out your complaint, you want to lay out the facts. Um, you want to describe the child using really concrete examples to give the hearing officer a real sense of who that child is. You want to give an overview of the relevant school history, then that's the school history relevant to your complaint, not necessarily relevant to your client or relevant to the child. Um, and you want to cite to evaluations um, that describe the child's needs. That may be something that you want to include. And you definitely want to include compelling case facts. But you always have to remember that you want to pick your facts judiciously. Um, you don't need to describe all of your facts. You don't need to lay everything out for the hearing officer and for opposing counsel. Sometimes including too much information in the facts section can actually harm your case down the line as witnesses for the other side read your complaint, know exactly what facts you're going to be pulling out, and find ways to explain away or minimize those facts. Um, the other thing you're definitely going to want to highlight in your complaint are the legal issues. Um, you always want to highlight the overall issue of a denial of faith, and then you want to go into the specific areas that are impacted, the specific denials under that penumbra of faith. Um, there are a number of examples we've provided here, certainly, and these are sort of the big areas, child find, failure to timely or fully evaluate, failure to develop or to implement an appropriate IEP, failure to provide an appropriate placement. Those are the sort of specific things you're going to be listing in your complaint. Um, what you need to remember, though, is all alleged violations, all of these issues, you must, in your case in chief, be able to tie them specifically to harm to how these things harm the child. It's not something you necessarily need to have completely laid out when you file, but you want to make sure that you've alleged in the facts section that there was harm to the child so that you can make sure to present that information uh, when you present your complaint. The next thing that you're going to focus a lot of time on is your proposed remedy. Um, it has to include the remedy, but it's the remedy that you knew about at the time that you filed. This is not set in stone, nor should it be set in stone. You can request anything necessary to um, ensure the provision of faith for the child. Now, if at this point you're unsure of the exact nature of the remedy that you're seeking, so for example, if you're looking for compensatory education to get that child back to where they would have been had the school system not denied them faith for years in the past, but you're not 100% sure what the child needs because your expert hasn't completely come up with the plan yet, you just need to make sure that you mention compensatory education and speak in broad terms about what you want. You can always come back and um, add more information to the remedy section at a later point. Um, some of the examples, we provide you some examples of things you might want to ask for as a remedy. For example, if a child hasn't been identified, of course one of the remedies you want is to identify the child as a child with a special need. Um, you might want to ask for different services be added to the IEP or additional services be added to the IEP. You might want to request that the LEA fund evaluations or that the LEA fund transportation to and placement at a non-public school if there's no placement within the district that can meet the child's needs. Um, and then, of course, compensatory education. Now, compensatory education is a very contentious area of the law. Compensatory education is often called comp ed, and I may refer to it like that throughout the training. Um, and it is the remedy for the past denials of faith. So in DC, compensatory education must place the child where they would have been but for the denial of faith. Um, it cannot be an hour for hour adjustment. So for example, the child missed 20 hours of speech and language services because the school system failed to provide it, therefore the child needs 20 hours of speech and language services. It must be particularized to the child. Now sometimes an hour for hour calculation absolutely works for the child, but you need to make sure you have some witness 
who can testify about why an hour-for-hour -hour calculation is exactly what's going to place this child where they would have been but for the denial of FAPE. The key case here is Reed versus DC. Um, and we provided you the citation, and I think the case law is also in the materials that we provide you. Um, but COMBED can be quite creative, and it can include a whole host of things. It could be tutoring, it could be additional therapy, speech language, physical therapy, occupational therapy. It could be transition services for an older child who may be transitioning out of special education soon. It could be vocational services, it could be mentoring, and it could also be concrete things like um, software or hardware, technology, assistive technology, assistive communication technology, things like that. So COMPED, you have to really parse out COMPED in your case in chief when you're thinking about how to present it. So you want to ask yourself, for the time period in question, what should the IEP have looked like? What should the placement have been? What kind of services should the child have been getting? And had everything been appropriate? Where would that child be at the point that you're filing your complaint? Then, once you've established that, then you start talking about what does this child need to get them up to that point. Um, and then you want to definitely, as you're thinking about filing and after you filed and you're putting your case in chief together, you want to consider some of the key questions that you're going to be asking folks to ensure that you get answers to all of these questions and lay out a full and complete accounting of where the child would have been and what they need to get there. So in terms of some tips we have for drafting the complaint, one, obviously be persuasive. Um, the other, clearly always review this with the client before you file. Um, it is a great way for you to make sure that it's laid out. It's a great way for the client to make sure they know everything that's being raised in the complaint. And it's also that last vetting where you can really raise issues or your client can bring up issues that maybe didn't make it into the complaint. If there's some of the timing things that are a little bit off, your client's going to be sometimes in the best position to be able to let you know where changes might need to take place. Um, you want to make sure that you consult federal and DC law to make sure that you've alleged all the issues that you could have alleged within this complaint. When in doubt, please be overly inclusive of legal issues. Um, and one of the examples we provide here is that if you are raising an issue about a child's placement, you always have to raise an issue about the IEP that was in place during that placement. The reason is, even if you think the IEP was fine, and if it only would be implemented in an appropriate placement, there are lots of things on that IEP that you may not, in fact, agree with. So for example, there's no place in the, the IEP in use in DC for anyone to add information about what kind of student-to-teacher ratio the child should have. Should the child be in a class of no more than 10 or 12 students, or can the, can the child learn in a classroom of 30 students with the appropriate supports? That information you can't capture on the IEP. And so if you have a child who cannot learn in a classroom with more than 12 students, and the IEP doesn't capture that, you need to be able to challenge the IEP on that front. Um, then you also want to make sure that your remedy addresses the, the client's needs and the client's goals. The response to the complaint, um, there, there doesn't need to be a response to the complaint in all cases, but the only time that there doesn't need to be a response to the complaint is if the respondent had provided proper prior written notice, utilizing all of the aspects of prior written notice as discussed in the law um, regarding the issues that you are raising. So if the respondent has failed to issue prior written notice that addresses all proper, and again, legal prior written notice, and that addresses all the issues that you raised in your complaint, then the respondent must file an answer to your complaint. The response should include an explanation of why the LEA decided to take the actions they took or why they decided not to take the actions. Um, other options that they considered taking and why those other options were not taken. Whether they relied on an evaluation, a procedure, information that was provided by team members and what information was provided. And then other factors that might have been relevant to either the proposed remedy or the, the refusal to, to move forward on a change. Um, so what this all means is that the response has to provide the parent notice 
And that response has to provide the parent notice not only on what areas the respondent proposes to defend on, but also the, the general basics of why and what areas they're defending. Why are they defending this, this particular issue um, and your claim about the denial of FAPE? If they fail to properly respond to your complaint and you raise that as an issue with the hearing officer, you have to make sure that you raise it as part of the greater harm to your client in terms of preparing their case in chief and the harm that is to your client and to the child when no proper notice is being provided. You can amend the complaint, um, but it's important to know that if you amend the complaint, um, in general, it's going to start the timeline over again. So from the date that you amend the complaint, once that complaint has been amended, that becomes day one. So if you amend the complaint later on in the process, that's going to elongate the, the, the process, the whole process. Let's say you amend the complaint on day 45, well suddenly that becomes day one. And then it's 75 days from that point of amendment to where your client is going to receive a hearing officer decision. Um, DCPS may argue, just so you know, DCPS may start to argue, or, and other LEAs may argue, that if you want to bring up facts not alleged in the complaint with specificity, you must amend the complaint. It is our contention that that's not true. As long as a fact supports an issue that you've already raised underlying the complaint, you should be able to raise those facts. We don't have to file with particularity. The law does contemplate that the amendments have to happen when you're raising new issues, not when you're raising new facts. Um, and so that is an argument that you may need to be prepared for if you're raising issues, if you're raising facts that you didn't discuss with particularity in your complaint. This particularly comes into play when you have facts that have come up since the filing of the complaint. Um, and those are those are things that you might want to argue stay out entirely, that the complaint is the four corners of the complaint, that nothing that happens since the filing of the complaint is allowed to come in. Just know that if you're making those arguments, um, sometimes those rules can be applied very strictly to the petitioner but are applied more loosely to the respondent, um, particularly where the respondent tries to tie actions into a proposed remedy that they have to the denial of faith, they are often able to get that information in. So you may amend the complaint only if certain areas are covered. So you may amend the complaint if the other person consents in writing and is given the opportunity to um, resolve the new issues that you are raising in the amendment. Or the hearing officer can, over the other party's objection, allow um, the permission to, to amend the complaint. Um, and the amendment must be filed no more than five business days prior to the hearing. So that also tracks with the disclosure deadline that we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, the other party can consent to waiving starting the timeline again when you amend the complaint. However, that is in our experience unlikely to happen. Now, motions can also be filed as part of due process complaints, and sometimes some cases have a very robust motions practice prior to the hearing being held. Um, you can file motions. The SOP allows motions to be filed, and the SOP does not, and the SOP is the standard operating procedures. The standard operating procedures does not specify exactly what motions can and cannot be filed. So we provided you some examples of motions that can be filed. For example, a motion for default, a motion for summary judgment, a motion to admit facts, not in evidence. A motion requesting a notice to appear if you want to compel a witness to appear. Um, you can also submit a uh, federal rules of civil procedure, Rule 8D motion, using all arguments that were not specifically denied have been averred. Um, or a directed verdict or a verdict on partial findings um, for administrative hearings. One thing to note is that particularly with motions for default summary judgment, those are very high standards. Um, in particular with a motion for default, if you want to see how high the standard for a lack of um, a failure to litigate, you can look to Massey versus DC, which is um, a case that really lays out just how far a school district must go to not litigate a case in order to qualify for a default. Um, 
As you're moving through the timeline, you're going to be invited to a dispute resolution session. The dispute resolution session is an opportunity to meet with a local education agency or agencies that are the respondent on your complaint to try and resolve the issues raised in the complaint. Just so that you know, although the law calls them dispute resolution sessions, DC Public Schools calls them resolution meeting sessions, RMSs. These meetings take place within 15 days of the date of filing. Um, they are not mandatory, but only if both parties have agreed to waive the right to have the resolution session. If one party waives the right to have a resolution session, but the other party does not, then the resolution session must go forward. The folks who are involved in the resolution session are the parent, the IEP members who have particularized, specialized knowledge of the facts that underline the complaint. There has to be someone from the LEA there who can, in fact, resolve the complaint. They have to have authority to resolve the complaint. And there can't be an attorney from the LEA unless the parent brings an attorney with them as well. Um, the one really important thing to remember during a dispute resolution session is these are not confidential settlement discussions. Anything that is discussed during a dispute resolution session is fair game to be brought up during the hearing, so make sure that you treat them accordingly. Um, one thing to also be aware of during the dispute resolution sessions um, is that it is often used as early discovery where the school tries to find more information out from the parent and where, to be frank, you can also find out information from the school um, and the school system about where they lie. Though often the person who is at the meeting and who is representing the school district won't, in fact, be authorized to reach settlement with you. Um, they will have limited authority. They will have authority to settle within a very limited range, and if you are suggesting something outside of the range, they may either say they are not authorized to do that or they may need to leave to discuss it with someone else before they can tell you whether or not they can go forward. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the realities of resolution sessions. Um, resolution sessions are really meant for the parties to come together to discuss and to come to resolution so that there aren't so many due process hearings um, involving children with special needs. However, that doesn't always happen. Um, if a resolution is not reached, now the parties if the parties agree that no resolution is possible, you sign a sheet that gets sent to the hearing officer and the hearing officer starts that 45-day litigation period and that's when you hold the hearing and then the hearing officer decision has to be reached at the end of those 45 days. If one party believes that a resolution can be reached even though the other party is convinced there is no chance it's going to happen, that, 30, that full 30-day resolution period remains open. Um, typically, if everybody decides that no resolution is possible, you sign a form at the meeting that gets sent to the hearing officer. Sometimes that doesn't happen, but if everyone has agreed to it, you can always reach out to the hearing officer um, and include the opposing counsel on it just to let the hearing officer know that the parties have agreed that no agreement can be reached. Um, if a resolution is reached, that resolution actually takes the form of a settlement agreement here in DC, and that's a settlement agreement that's signed by the parent and by the LEA representative. The agreement, like contracts in the District of Columbia, can be voided within three days of having been signed. And um, the settlement agreement actually contains a great number of the boilerplate language that you might find in settlements further down the line in litigation. One thing that we do want to make folks aware of, though, is that there has been some problematic language that's being included, the problematic boilerplate language included in these settlement agreements. And these, this is language that we do recommend that you talk through with your client and, and that if it, suits, if it doesn't suit your client's ultimate goal to accept the settlement agreement with that language, then you need to reject the settlement. The big one is that there is now standard language that says that settling, signing the settlement agreement, settles all claims that your client raised in the complaint or that they could have raised in the complaint at the date of filing. So essentially what it's saying is the settlement agreement goes beyond the four corners of your complaint into any area that might possibly have been an area that you could have raised. This becomes problematic if, for example, your client has requested an independent evaluation and all you filed on is an independent evaluation because the school system has failed to either provide authorization or has failed to file suit against your client to prove that their evaluations were sufficient. 
And so you find yourself affirmatively filing just to get an evaluation. Well, there may be other issues in line, but you need that evaluation before you can go ahead on those issues. And that might be an issue. Uh, if you sign a settlement agreement saying you've, saying just getting an IEE, for example, solves and resolves all of the issues that you raise in the complaint and all issues you could have raised. There are, of course, arguments to be made about why that is not true. And you are, of course, welcome as you approach these, these sort of milestone moments in your case to reach out to your CLC mentor or folks in your firm who may have also handled cases with us to kind of talk about strategy. But there are things we wanted to bring up to you. Mediation is also a possibility within these cases. Um, it is voluntary, however, and both parties have to agree to, mitigate, to, to mediation. So if the parent wants mediation but the school system does not want to mediate, it won't go forward. Um, it is available prior to filing. So you can file a complaint only to have mediation. You don't actually have to file a due process complaint. You can just file a request for mediation. And you can file for mediation after your due process complaint has been filed, even if you haven't asked for it within that complaint. Um, if mediation goes beyond the 30-day resolution period, then it actually tolls that additional 45 days to litigate and have the hearing officer decision issued. So just be aware of that. If you're entering into mediation and the mediation looks like it needs to go beyond 30 days, if you agree to take it beyond 30 days, it will toll that 45-day litigation period. Um, all discussions within mediation, unlike a dispute resolution session, are confidential. Um, and they're confidential regardless of the results. If it's resolved, the parent and the LEA will end up with a signed settlement agreement that results from the mediation. Um, Pre-hearing conferences happen in the District of Columbia, and they generally happen after the resolution session has occurred. It's conducted on phone. It's not a face-to-face -face meeting generally. Um, it's generally between the hearing officer, opposing counsel, and you. Um, and it's going to cover a range of issues. Before the pre-hearing conference is held, you will likely receive an email outlining the issues that the hearing officer expects to discuss at the pre-hearing conference, and that way you can prepare for it. Um, but basically, there are going to be some management issues. So you're going to talk about the time you need to present your case in chief. You're going to talk about hearing dates, what dates you and your client and your witnesses are available. So that's all information you're going to want to make sure you have at hand before the pre-hearing conference. You're going to talk about disclosure dates. Um, it becomes tricky, for example, when there's federal holidays. You just want to make sure everyone's on the same page with disclosure dates. Uh, and there may be some other deadlines. So for example, the hearing officer may decide that they want motions filed prior to the disclosure deadline. So they may set some internal deadlines for when things need to happen that go beyond the scope of what the law sets up for timelines. Um, the other thing that the hearing conference is often used for is to review and to narrow down the issues that were raised in the complaint. And um, they're also going to talk about what evidence you might be bringing, including witnesses, um, whether there's filing preferences. These are some of the nuts and bolts. You know, does the hearing officer want you to file disclosures via fax? Does the hearing officer want you to FedEx them overnight? Do they want you to hand deliver them? Do they want them tabbed? How do they want them numbered? Um, and the other thing that's going to be discussed is whether you want and your client wants an open or closed hearing. So. If it's an open hearing, that means observers can come in. If it's a closed hearing, that means it's only open to the hearing officer, respondent, and your client. When you're preparing for the pre-hearing conference, um, you're going to want to review the issues to be discussed, which is what the hearing officer will send you beforehand. You want to review your complaint, read it, know it, um, be able to talk about it cohesively. You want to know your issues, um, and you want to know all of your issues in particular, particularly because hearing officers may want to narrow the issues, and you really want to keep them as broad as possible to ensure that you can present the most robust case in chief you can. You also want to know the law, though generally you're not going to be arguing legal tenants during these pre-hearing conferences. Sometimes they do devolve into legal arguments, particularly if there are outstanding motions where you've already filed a motion. You may need to orally re-argue that motion during your pre-hearing conference, and so you're going to want to know the law underpinning that motion. You're going to want to know some of the major things that might come up, for example, statute of limitations issues and things of that nature. Um, you also want to have thought about any motions that you might want to file, because you may need to give the hearing officer notice of those motions so that the hearing officer can set timelines so that you can file and then uh, the school system can respond 
giving the hearing officer enough time to make a decision prior to the hearing. You also are going to want to know your witnesses and know your evidence. This is an area where there is definitely a disparity between a petitioner and a respondent. Um, you may realize that you are being pushed to proffer what your witnesses are going to be testifying to, proffer names of witnesses, what their roles are, and that the respondent is just asked how many witnesses they'll provide and the respondent is allowed to say something like five or six or maybe seven and I think at least one or two might be experts. Though you may lose the battle. We definitely encourage you to push for specifics from the respondent on who they're planning on calling, who they're planning on calling as experts, what area those experts are going to be certified as experts in, um, and make sure that you have as much information as possible going forward because you don't want the respondent to be able to use the pre-hearing conference as also a free moment of discovery. After the pre-hearing conference, you're going to get a pre-hearing order, or PHO. You'll see it referred to as PHO throughout the rest of this training. Um, the pre-hearing order is going to give you usually about three days to respond. So you want to, when you get it, you want to read it, and you want to read it carefully. Um, because you are going to want to respond if there are any issues with, for example, your issues that you've raised, if the hearing officer has perhaps accidentally written something down that's incorrect about your issue or overly narrowed an issue to what you thought everyone had agreed to at the pre-hearing conference. You want to make sure your witnesses are listed correctly and that the other party's witnesses are listed correctly. You want to make sure to read it through for any specifics about things that the hearing officer may want. So for example, that the hearing officer requests anybody being called as an expert must have a CV disclosed as evidence in order to be called, if they want people who are going to be testifying by phone to be marked as such, if they have particularities in terms of paper, in terms of numbering, if they want to have joint exhibits, that'll all be part of the pre-hearing order. Um, so in addition to within three days you want to be able to respond to anything that might be wrong with the order, you also want to make sure you respond for any clarifying questions. If you have a question about anything that's in that order, you want to ask the hearing officer so you make sure you're 100% clear on what they expect of you. So now we get to talk about the due process hearing disclosure process. Um, this, for people who have practiced in other areas, this just feels odd. And it does, and it sounds a little odd, but this is the way it works, and I trust me, you'll get used to it. Um, at least five business days prior to the first day of the hearing, the parties must provide copies of all the documents that they are planning on offering as evidence and a list of all the witnesses and usually proffers about what those witnesses will testify to each other. Both sides file on the same day, so the filings are not at all responsive. Um, and most motions also must be filed by this time period, by the five-day disclosure time period. So, after, so unless there is a legal requirement, and we'll talk about those in just a second, about what should be disclosed, you really have total control over what information you are going to disclose to the other party. Now, ostensibly, most of the information is already going to be in the possession of the other party because much of it is school records that you've already gotten from the schools. But because of what we talked about in a different training where all the school records are kept in varying um, paper files, in varying electronic files, sometimes your opposing counsel may not have access to all the documents you've been able to pull out from the school system. So you really have to decide what you're going to disclose, what's helpful to your case, what might be harmful to your case that you don't want to disclose, or what might be harmful and you want to disclose it and sort of rip it off quickly like a Band-Aid so you can diffuse it easily. Um, there is no other discovery within due process complaints, within this administrative hearing. The disclosures are it. Um, and so that is why it's so important that you make sure you organize your disclosures and think about them, but it is also why folks who have litigated in other areas where there are responsive, um, there's responsive discovery that goes back and forth are a little bit surprised at what happens at the hearing. So when you're looking at what documents you want to choose for disclosure, you really want to start out by being overly inclusive. So you want to just put in everything you might possibly want to have in evidence, everything you might possibly have as a, a witness refer to or things you want to refer the hearing officer to. Um, and then once you have that list, 
you want to start thinking about what witness information, you want to start winnowing them down to say, well, this one has so many positives, but a number of negatives. Is this repetitive? Is there a better way for me to get this information on the record? Um, and then, you know, does it contain so much harmful information that whatever benefit I could get out of it would not, in fact, benefit my client's ultimate goals? Um, the law requires you to include, and this is really the only requirement within the law for what you must include in your disclosures. You must include any reports or documents that you expect your expert to rely on to formulate the basis of their opinion. So if they're going to talk about their opinion about what the child needs and they refer to certain documents, those documents have to be in evidence. Additionally, if you have an expert that has written a report, that report has to be in evidence. Other than that, you can choose what you want um, in terms of what you're going to disclose. Um, you should definitely consider including any IEPs um, from the relevant time period or from just before the relevant time period to kind of set things up for how things were for your client's child at the time that you're starting the complaint. Um, you also want to include any relevant correspondence with the local education agency. You want to include records requests if, for example, you're raising an issue of a failure to provide records. You want to look at meeting confirmation information, meeting note addendum, um, other advocacy letters that you've written to the school. You also um, want to make sure um, that you include the proof of receipt for any document that you've sent to the school to make sure that it's clear that they received it. Um, and then, of course, any other documents that are useful or supportive to your claims. When you're organizing the disclosures, you want to include a cover letter. And the cover letter is going to have a list of all your witnesses with the proffers and how to reach those witnesses. It's also going to include information about who might be called as an expert, who might be testifying by telephone, and then a list of all the documents that you are, plan that you are disclosing and plan to enter in as evidence. Um, if you're having an expert witness, um, you want to make sure that you've got a resume, and the most updated resume is, of course, the best. And you want to make sure that you disclose that and list that as a separate document to be entered in as ev evidence. Um, you also um, you know, want to make sure that if, for example, you want to reserve the right to call opposing counsel's witnesses as your own, you can put that in the cover letter as well. Um, impeachment documents are interesting in due process complaints, and each hearing officer handles this slightly differently. Um, technically, of course, you don't have to disclose a document that you're going to use to impeach someone because impeachment documents are not being entered in as evidence. They're just being entered in to impeach the testimony of someone who is providing um, information on the record. However, not all hearing officers allow non-disclosed documents to be used for impeachment. Um, the other thing to know is that even if you don't want that particular document in as evidence and the hearing officer allows you to use it as impeachment, the hearing officer may sua sponte just allow that document in as evidence and so will order it to be entered into the record and then it will become part of the permanent record even if you perhaps didn't necessarily want it to be in there. Um, in terms of the nuts and bolts, sort of the mechanics of delivering disclosures, so all your exhibits have got to be numbered. Um, the hearing officer may not request that you number pages in a particular way, though we always recommend that you actually have some kind of pagination because it can be very difficult where you have, for example, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 documents and one document has seven pages and one has 12 pages and you want to be able to refer someone to a particular page within a particular document. It helps move your testimony along if you're able to refer them to a specific page number rather than telling them to count sort of from the start of the document, you know, turn to P27, count seven pages in, look halfway down that page. Um, so we definitely recommend that you do some sort of pagination even if the hearing officer hasn't requested it. Um, in terms of service, you should serve the respondent first. So your disclosure should go first to the LEA who is the respondent in your case. And you can hand deliver it or you can fax it under the standard operating procedures. You may have been able to work out ahead of time that opposing counsel will accept a faxed PDF copy, but that would have to be something you worked out ahead of time and something that's in writing and something that's been communicated to the hearing officer. Um, you want to make sure that you serve 
the opposing counsel first, the respondent first, and then you want to make sure that proof of service is attached to the disclosures that you then provide to the student hearing officer and those are the to, to the student hearing office. And those are the ones that get provided to the student hearing officer. Um, you want to make sure to do that because you're providing the student hearing office proof that you have proved that you have served opposing counsel with all of your disclosures. Um, if you're doing hand delivery, what we recommend is that you also bring a spare copy of your letter, the cover letter that you're bringing with your disclosures, so that you yourself can have your own copy of the date stamped disclosure letter, and it'll have the date stamp from the LEA on the top and also from the student hearing office. And that way, if any issue about whether the disclosures were served comes up, you have your own copy that has been appropriately date stamped. Um, now, the pre hearing order may, of course, provide specific information about how you are to deliver these disclosures, and so make sure that you do that too. Um, and so some hearing officers want you to bring two copies to the student hearing office, and they want their copy tabbed. Um, some hearing officers want you to FedEx it. Some hearing officers don't want to see anything from you until the day of the hearing, but they want you to bring them an extra binder. Um, so all of that will be in the pre-hearing order, and you should make sure to check that out before you complete your discovery delivery. Um, we provide you with the service address and phone numbers, but always, always, always make sure to confirm before you send someone out to either hand deliver or before you're going to fax information in, please call. So please call the number we provided for DC Public Schools headquarters, for example, if you're suing DC Public Schools. If you're, if you're going up against a charter school, you need to call that charter school specifically and get that information. There are just too many charter schools who serve as their own LEAs for us to list them, unfortunately. Um, and then also with the student hearing office, just call and confirm the fax number. There have been a number of changes with fax numbers um, in recent history, and you don't want to be caught having faxed it to a number that has recently changed. So when you get the respondent's disclosures, um, the first thing you're going to kind of want to do is review the witness list. You're going to want to see whether that's going to give you insight into their case, how they are planning on defending, who they are planning on calling. Um, and it may also indicate that someone is going to be testifying in an area that you're going to object to. And so you want to think about those objections as well. You want to look through the documents. Um, you want to review the content. Don't just look at the list of documents that are being disclosed. Really look at the content. Even if the document that's being disclosed appears by the title to be the same document that you have disclosed. Often the documents that have been provided to the parent don't match up with the documents that have been saved into the school system's own electronic records keeping system. So you want to know where those differences lie. Um, and there have been some really incredible inconsistencies between documents and that gives rise to um, a whole host of other issues that you are going to need to address when you get to the day of the hearing. You also want to look and prepare your objections, um, objections to documents, objections to witnesses. Um, and you want to make sure that important witnesses get copies of all of your disclosures and DC Public Schools' disclosures, or the LEA's disclosure, if it's a charter school or the Office of the State Superintendent of Education, OSSE. So you want to make sure that you have enough copies of the disclosures, that you have your own copy for preparation. You want to make sure you have a witness copy that you can bring with you for witness prep and that you'll bring with you to the hearing for those witnesses who are testifying in person to use. Then you want to make sure any witness who is testifying by telephone has their own copy of all the documents because they're going to need copies of those documents in order to testify by telephone because you might refer them to documents, opposing counsel might refer them to documents, and the hearing officer might refer them to documents. And then, of course, your expert. Even if your expert's going to be with you in person testifying, your expert's going to want to have their own copy of the documents to review in those final days before the hearing because that might actually aid them in making their assessments um, to, you know, and, and making their testimony um, responsive to the documents that are in evidence. <clears throat> Cases do settle. Um, they don't settle as frequently in these administrative hearings as they do, I think, in the rest of the world of civil litigation. Um, but there, is, there are opportunities for settlement. Um, you may decide to make the first written settlement offer to opposing counsel. Um, they may decide to make an offer to you. Settlement discussions are confidential, um, but 
the reality is we do recommend that you be careful about what you disclose during settlement because sometimes in our experience those that information or the fruit of that tree has found its way into the case in chief so you want to be wary of the information you're providing even though the settlement discussions and negotiations are supposed to be confidential additionally um, the settlements rarely happen until right up to the eve of hearing. So it's rare. If you don't settle at a resolution session, it's rare that you're going to be able to settle before one and possibly two weeks before that hearing. And sometimes it happens within a matter of days before the hearing. Um, you may need opposing counsel's permission, for example, to discuss settlement with someone. So for example, there may be someone who's reached out to you as part of the dispute resolution session and they re-reach out to you. You may want to clear that with your opposing counsel just to make sure that that's not the person that opposing counsel is considering their client um, for purposes of discussing case matters. Um, and so all of these things sort of go into play and of course you want to make sure to read through all the language and all the language is in play in settlement but oftentimes you have to push really hard to get some of that boilerplate language changed. Other steps. Um, there's of course a lot of other steps. So hearings are a lot like trials. Um, there are opening and closing statements. Um, there's legal arguments, of course, that you're going to be making. There's witness testimony. You should be making objections to preserve the record. Opposing counsel will be making objections to propose to uh, preserve the record. Um, you're going to want to prepare your witnesses before the day of the trial. Um, and some of your witnesses may require multiple sessions. And, and to be frank, some of those folks may be your clients and, and family members because this is a really new area and it's scary um, to testify and so we definitely recommend preparing with your client um, and doing a really good and thorough prep with your client and even sometimes prepping multiple times. We also recommend that you prep cross-examinations with all of your witnesses to make sure that they know what to expect. We encourage you to be mean um, so that folks know when how to respond when someone's being mean or angry um, because you want to talk with them also about how to appropriately respond, particularly folks who haven't necessarily testified before. Um, you want to make sure they kind of understand the intricacies there. Um, you also want to prepare for additional legal arguments that might be raised. You want to research issues um, that might arise, for example, the rule on witnesses, experts' rights to hear other people's testimony, so essentially the experts' right to sit in the room. Um, you know, Opposing counsel may have uh, may attempt to limit your ability to enter information into the record, and you want to anticipate that, and then anticipate the responses you're going to need to provide um, if they're going to object to some of your documents. Um, so we provided you some tips for preparing your witnesses. Um, you want to prepare particularly your client and other lay witnesses for the general flow of the hearing. Um, your client is going to be in the hearing with you from start to finish. So you want to make sure that they have a sense of what's going on. Um, you want to make sure the hearing order is you know, established with your client in particular. You want to talk about witness order, ideal witness order, and then there may not be, you may not be able to achieve your ideal witness order because witnesses may be available at different times. Um, and so you just need to know who's available when, you want to make sure that you have contact information for folks who are going to be testifying by phone. You want to make sure people who are coming know where to come, those sorts of um, basic information. And then, of course, you want to go over the direct and the cross. You want to go over the basics of testimony as well, not just the questions, but sort of how to behave when you are testifying. You want to make sure to establish with everyone, and this seems so basic, but sometimes it's really important, just make sure everyone tells the truth. Um, and even if they think it's going to disappoint you, that's one of the reasons why prep is so good because you're going to hear things and bad facts are going to come out and that way you're prepared to deal with them. And so you want to make sure that you let folks know that, um, that you want to hear all the bad facts and that they can't lie to cover up any bad facts during the hearing. You want to make sure that your witnesses do not guess. So you want to make sure that you tell them if you don't know, the appropriate thing to say is I don't know. And if you don't remember, the appropriate thing to say is, I don't remember. Because remember, you as a lawyer can refresh recollection. If someone doesn't remember, you can refer them to a document, you can refer them to anything um, to refresh their recollection. But if they say, I don't know, you can't refresh their recollection because they've established on the record that they don't, in fact, know something. Um, 
you want to make sure to assure folks that they shouldn't worry if what they're saying comes out wrong or twisted or doesn't quite make sense. Make sure that your witnesses know it's not their job to make sure that the record is clear. It's your job. And it really relieves a lot of attention and a lot of the anxiety that some of your witnesses might be carrying. For you to say, don't worry about it, I got it. If it comes out in a way you didn't anticipate it coming out, I will be able to ask questions that will make sure the record is clear. Um, you don't want to pref- you don't you want to make sure that your witnesses don't refer to documents unless you've specifically told them to refer to a document. Um, and this is where, for example, um, if they don't remember something when you're refreshing their recollection, you can even ask them, "Is there something that might refresh your recollection?" And they could say, "Yes, the IEP meeting notes from you know last year." And then you can refer them to the document so they can take a look at it and then testify. Um, One thing to also know and to prepare your witnesses is that in addition to your direct and the cross-examination, the hearing officer may have some questions for them, and they should be prepared for that kind of interaction. Um, The one really important thing is please do not coach your witnesses, and I think everyone kind of knows that, but really, you know, if you are asking a question and you don't get an answer, you don't get the answer you were expecting, and you know what the answer to the question should be because, of course, on direct, you're not asking questions you don't already know the answers to. Um, although that actually holds two for cross as well. Um, But make sure that if you ask a question and it comes up with an answer that is not responsive to the question you thought you were asking, rather than correcting the witness, what you need to do is perhaps correct the question, Um, you know, and even explain to the witness, I'm sorry, I don't think I asked that question correctly. Let me see if I can rephrase it. If I rephrase it like this, you know, what, what, you know, what would you say if I asked you this question? Um, that way you can make sure that you're asking the right questions. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is if it's not working out during the preparation, if you're asking questions and it's not coming up with the answer that you know what happened and the client just isn't able to answer, you may need to just cut that question or cut an entire line of questioning. And, and just know that you'll be able to get that information out in other ways. Um, but don't feel badly about having to cut certain sections out because during witness prep it becomes clear that that's not going to be an option for you. All right, at the due process hearing itself, it takes place at Aussie's, in Aussie's building on the second floor um, in the student hearing office. The folks who are involved are you and your client, opposing counsel and their client, and the hearing officer. Practical things that you should remember about the hearing, there's a number of them. Number one, the hearing rooms are usually small conference rooms. And the parties are sitting very close to one another. You're just sort of sitting across the table from opposing counsel and right next to the hearing officer. Everything is done sitting down in these hearings. Um, There's no standing up. There's no presentation of evidence that requires standing. Um, You may or may not have time for a full lunch break or for a lunch break that would allow you to leave and go get lunch. So you may want to bring some snacks with you, bring something to drink so that when you take small breaks, you can step out into the hallway and eat something, drink a little bit of something. You also want to prepare your client. um, And you want to prepare your client, first and foremost, for hearing upsetting things and prepare them for how to respond appropriately. Um, There are very formal expectations for behavior, even in this informal setting, which sometimes confuses folks because it seems folksy in a way. Um, Make sure your client knows that they cannot respond, for example, directly. If opposing counsel says something your client does not agree with, Your client cannot respond to opposing counsel. Your client cannot respond to the hearing officer unless the hearing officer has asked your client specifically a question. Um, You also want to establish how you and your client are going to communicate during the hearing, and that might be writing notes back and forth. Um, However it is, you want to make sure that your client has access to you during the hearing, um, for example, so that they can let you know if um, a witness for the respondent is not telling the truth and it's not in an area that you all had discussed before, things like that. If they have a question, you want to make sure that you maintain those lines of communication open. Um, Phone witnesses, you want to prepare your witnesses and also ensure that the respondent's witnesses are testifying in a room alone with no one else. They can have no documents in front of them except the disclosures and they have to keep the disclosures closed unless they've been asked to open them. So they can't have their own notes. They can have their own documents. Even if their own documents are the documents that were disclosed, they can only have the disclosed documents. They can't have their own copies in front of them. Um, One thing that you may want to do with both your client and your witnesses is moot out difficult areas, moot out across 
With your client, you may even want to moot out a difficult part for pre-hearing matters. If you're going to be arguing, if there's an outstanding motion and there's going to be oral argument on an outstanding motion during pre-hearing matters, you want to talk to your client about it, moot out what things they might hear and how they will respond, which particularly in a pre-hearing matter is by not saying anything. Um, by writing you a note if needed, but not by saying anything, not by making any noises or, you know, harumphing in their seats. Um, you also want to assure them of a legal strategy and sort of how hearings progress, particularly with your client, because you want to let them know that sometimes things will come up and you're not going to address them right away because you have a strategy for addressing them later in a more powerful way. So you just want to make sure that your client is aware, that you're aware of certain situations and that you are going to address it at a later time. So then once you're in the hearing, um, there's a number of things that happen before you do your opening statement. Um, the first is just introductions. Everybody introduces themselves and the hearing officer will ask whether you waive a reading of the parent's rights. We often say yes because you've already explained all the rights that the parent has to them. Um, so often we waive the, the reading of the parent's rights. Then we move on to preliminary matters and preliminary matters can encompass a whole host of areas. It can include outstanding pre-hearing motions that have not yet been ruled on. It can include motions that have been ruled on and you want to renew the motion or you want to renew an objection. Um, particularly if there were rulings that happened on oral motions or oral argument that was done during the pre-hearing conference, which is an off-the-record discussion, and you want to put some of that information onto the record, the pre-hearing time period is when you do that, when you remake your order, you remake your oral argument on certain issues. That way it's part of the record that sets you up if you need to appeal in the future. Um, it is also where you talk about the disclosures and admit the documents and evidence. Admitting documents and evidence happens before the witnesses get on the stand for the most part. Um, if there are no objections to a particular document or a series of documents, those documents come in and they are in as evidence and they have as much weight as any other document that has been discussed by a witness. This is again an area that confuses folks who have practiced law in other areas or who have watched any of the legal procedurals on television. This sounds nuts, but this is the way in which it is done in our um, administrative hearings is that by the time you call your witnesses most of your documents will already be in as evidence or will have already been ruled um, as objected to and will be excluded. Um, the hearing officer will when there is an objection and the hearing officer may withhold their judgment and those are the documents where for example the respondent or your opposing counsel makes an objection you make your argument they make your argument and the hearing officer will say I'm going to withhold judgment until you can have a witness testify to the veracity of this document, to the weight of this document, the admissibility of this document, um, and then at that point they will either admit it or um, exclude it. And this will happen on both sides. So you want to make sure you have your own objections to um, opposing counsel's documents so that you can make sure you preserve that record as well. The one thing that you should keep in mind is that sometimes you have to assert affirmatively that you have preliminary matters. Sometimes what will happen is the hearing officer will move through, they'll move through disclosures and they'll say, and now we're going to start with opening statements, but you have an outstanding motion or you want to make a new oral motion based on some of the disclosures that were entered into evidence. Um, you have to affirmatively assert that before you start your case in chief. The rules of evidence. Um, Evidentiary rules are not strictly applied in our due process hearings. Um, however, you may have to use them in order to get documents in. You may have to utilize them when arguing about what witnesses can testify. And different hearing officers have different standards about whether they apply, how they apply various rules of evidence, whether they apply the various rules of evidence. And these are things that you can talk about with colleagues who've had cases. And you can also reach out to your CLC mentor who might have information on that particular hearing officer and where they fall on the spectrum as well. Um, the one really important thing to know is that hearsay is admissible. Um, whether something is hearsay in these hearings goes to weight rather than admissibility. Um, the thing is double or triple hearsay may be barred. By that point, the weight of the evidence may be so little that the hearing officer doesn't want it cluttering up the record. Um, some of the useful hearsay that gets in is, for example, your letters, your advocacy letters to school members. 
um, to schools or to particular members of the school. Um, client or paralegal statements about what happened at meetings because when people are testifying, folks can testify about what other people said at meetings and you can utilize that in these due process hearings to prove your case. There is some evidentiary law though that you definitely want to review even though again the rules of evidence are only loosely applied. You definitely want to review the qualifications for an expert. Um, Wag, um, I'm sorry, Wagman is the law of the land here in the District of Columbia and you want to make sure that you have reviewed that so that you can make that argument. Um, and this is something that's really important for you because you're going to probably have to fight out, do a little battle to get your expert in um, after voir dire, but also because this is something that you may need to explain to some of your experts. You may be working with an expert, um, for example, a speech and language pathologist or a psychologist who has not testified in these kinds of hearings before. And they might have a different idea of what it means to be an expert. An expert in the professional sense is different than what an expert in the legal sense means. And it's very important that you explain this to folks that you're calling as experts because otherwise they might be very reluctant to call themselves experts or to allow themselves to be called experts by you. So you really want to break down the Wagman standard, which is essentially that the person has knowledge not generally available to the trier of fact and that would be helpful to the trier of fact in coming to a final conclusion. And it's a very different standard. So you don't have to be published, you don't have to be considered an expert in your field. You just have to have the kind of training and experience that provides you knowledge not available to the hearing officer in the normal course of the hearing officer's business and that would be helpful to the hearing officer um, to hear in order to make a decision. You also want to make sure that you have down um, when expert witnesses can in fact give testimony to issues of ultimate fact, when lay witnesses can give opinion testimony, weight versus admissibility kind of across the board, and then the exceptions to hearsay because sometimes you're going to confront a hearing officer who may declare that something is hearsay and the weight is so little in their mind that it shouldn't be admitted and you can argue one of the hearsay exceptions which then raises the value of that piece of evidence and can get it in. Um, your case in chief starts with your opening statement. Oftentimes a respondent will um, hold their opening statement for their case in chief. They won't give it right away. Um, your witnesses are then going to go after you provide your opening. You're going to provide witness testimony. Um, you may need to account for your witnesses' availability. So you may not be able to present your witnesses in the ideal order, um, and there may be some timing issues, and those are things you can talk about with opposing counsel beforehand. You can talk about it in preliminary matters, um, but you just need to know when your witnesses are available so you know when to call them and can kind of move through everybody as quickly as possible and most efficiently. Um, you're definitely going to need to voir dire your expert witness unless there have been stipulations to the expert witness um, being an expert in the area that you're asking. Of course, the ancillary issue to that is you need to make sure that you know what you're going to qualify your expert as an expert in. Um, witnesses, of course, can testify by phone. Um, but again, if you haven't identified a witness as testifying by phone, you may be barred from calling someone by phone. So that's why it's really important that you need to make sure you note who might be testifying by phone in your disclosures. Um, <clears throat> the respondent's witnesses will then go. So after you close your case in chief, then the respondent has an opportunity to give an opening. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, and then they present their witnesses. Um, not all the witnesses that are listed may actually testify. So you may get a list of 10 witnesses, but only four end up testifying. Um, that may be something that you want to talk about prior to uh, in the preliminary matters because you might want to have them proffer which of the witnesses they've listed are actually going to testify. For example, if you get a list of 20 witnesses, you absolutely want a proffer. If also they have witnesses listed in the alternative, so and so, you know, the, the principal will be testifying or the assistant principal. By the time the hearing starts, they should know which of those people is going to be testifying and you can ask them to proffer at the beginning who will be testifying specifically. You also want to make sure before the hearing starts that you've prepared objections to um, some of the witnesses particularly. So for example, sometimes what you'll see is a witness will be listed, for example, the special education coordinator or designee. 
you should be prepared to object to anybody who has not been specifically listed as a witness or someone who is being called to testify about an area as a designee for someone that they don't actually have that content knowledge. So, for example, the special education coordinator or designee is listed, you object to the designee status. The respondent successfully says, no, 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 I'm going to have the speech and language pathologist testify as a designee and then you can prove that the speech and language pathologist doesn't in fact have the knowledge that the special education coordinator has, so can't in fact be the designee. So you can't have, for example, the speech and language pathologist testify about speech language pathology in place of what a special education coordinator would testify to or in place of what a teacher would testify to. Um, once all the witnesses have testified on the record and you've closed your case in chief and the respondent has closed their response in their case as well, then we move into closing arguments. Um, the closing arguments, what's really important to know is you may be providing closing arguments within minutes of the close of the case. So you need to make sure that you have your closing prepped and ready to go before you enter the room um, to start the hearing. Um, sometimes they do allow additional time to prep. You can get 15 or 20 minutes to prep day of. Sometimes hearing officers will request written closings, um, though there are certain things that come with written closings, for example, page limits, uh, that sometimes for particularly long hearings or complex hearings are not necessarily something that you want to have to deal with as you propose your closing arguments. Um, but that aside, when you give your closing argument, you want to make sure that you include references to relevant legal cases. You want to make sure that you also provide copies. Now, this is going to sound strange. But if you are bringing up case law that is not well-known case law or something that you've discovered in your research, you're going to actually want to bring copies of that case law to the hearing. Because when you reference that case, the hearing officer may stop you and say, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that case. That way you can just pull it out of your bag and say, I have copies for you and opposing counsel. Would you like copies? Um, I know that sounds odd, but that does happen. And in fact, it helps move things along more quickly when you're able to provide actual copies of the law to folks in the hearing room. Um, you also want to incorporate what's happened in the hearing in your closing. There will be lots of admissions that you didn't expect um, that happen. Your witnesses may say things that you didn't anticipate that they said that you need to address in your closing. Documents you thought you were going to get in might have been excluded. Documents you thought you were going to be able to exclude might have been included. And so you want to make sure you address those things within the closing. Um, the thing about the hearing uh, overall is that you really want to make your record. Um, and this is a really important part. So you want to make sure you object, even if you think you're going to lose, even if the hearing officer has made it very clear that they do not believe you in whatever kind of objection you're making. If it is a legal basis that you're objecting to and you believe you are right and there's legal underpinnings, you keep making those objections to preserve your record. And you can even say, you know, I'll make a continuing objection to X kind of evidence or to this document being referred to, those sorts of things. And that way you've preserved your record. Um, you also can make proffers. So for example, if your witness is prevented from testifying about a certain area because the hearing officer rules on an objection by opposing counsel or imposes time limits that you're not successfully able to push back, you can make proffers on the record to what your witness would have testified to had had they been allowed to go forward and testify. Um, you also want to make sure you reinforce the important points throughout. So in your opening, you want to reinforce your case in chief, your theory of the case, sort of set the stage, your witness testimony, your closing. You want to make sure they're all connected, that they're all tied together. Um, you want to make sure in your closing in particular that you um, refer to the documents you referred to in your case in chief. And you want to make sure in your case in chief that you refer to as many documents as you can. Though you don't have to refer to all documents. Once again, once a document has been entered in um, through disclosures, if there's been no objection, it's in the record. But you want to make sure that you bring it out, either through witness testimony or in your closing. You want to make sure that you are referring the hearing officer to various documents. Because otherwise, the hearing officer may not just read through all the documents that were included in evidence. They may only refer to the documents that were used as part of your case in chief. And so you want to make sure that you reference everything that you want the hearing officer to look to. Um, in your hearing, you must expect the unexpected. Um, 
Not all hearing officers are going to allow a standardized presentation of your case, so you have to be able to respond to changes in witness order, to changes in lots of different other orders, to rulings on motions, to withholding a ruling on a motion that really should be ruled on before you present your case in chief until after you've presented your case in chief. Um, you want to make sure that you don't get stymied in some of these things because sometimes quick reaction is key. Um, you want to analyze when you're going to fight something and when you're going to let it go. Um, and you're going to want to know when something might throw things into chaos. And to be frank, sometimes chaos is good. Um, sometimes your purpose is to muddy the waters and you need to have thought about that a little bit ahead of time. Um, but also to be prepared enough in your case in chief that you can make those kind of assessments on the fly. Um, the other thing that I know you know, but we want to just bring up, is that witnesses say the darndest things sometimes. Even after you've prepped, even after everyone has, has been completely sure and they know what questions you're going to ask, um, witnesses forget things. They become overwhelmed. They um, get intimidated. They get angry. They respond differently than they did when you were prepping. And you're going to have to be prepared to rehabilitate a witness, and then you're sometimes just going to have to be prepared to know when you just cannot rehabilitate that person and you need to let that issue drop. Um, you can sometimes utilize opposing counsel witness statements to bolster your case, um, and that is sometimes an added benefit. Often opposing counsel hasn't necessarily prepped as much with their clients and with their witnesses as you have, and so sometimes their witnesses also say the darndest things, uh, and you can utilize that to support your case in chief. After your hearing has closed, sometimes there are post-hearing filings or motions that are still expected. Um, sometimes the hearing officers request them. Sometimes you actually request them because you don't feel a hearing officer has fully heard you on an issue, and you request time to present a post-hearing brief on a particular issue that is in contention. Um, it may also be in an area that wasn't covered in the hearing. So for example, if you don't have time to do a written closing, or if you don't have time to do oral closings, but you don't want to come back for, for example, a third or fourth day of a hearing, you can agree to do written closings. There may be affidavits that the hearing officer requests that, you want, that they want submitted after the case is closed. Hearing officer decisions are issued only after the entire record has been closed. So that includes not only the closure of your case in chief, and the respondent's case, but also if there are any post-hearing motions or closing statements that are going to be written and submitted, the hearing officer decision will not be issued until after all of those motions have been submitted to the hearing officer and reviewed by the hearing officer. The, um, the HOD, the hearing officer decision, will be issued and it will have all the identifying information pulled out. So it will be essentially redacted, a redacted hearing officer decision because all of the hearing officer decisions are put online. Um, and in order to protect the confidentiality of the parties involved, particularly the students and their parents, um, all identifying information is removed. However, you will know it's your hearing officer decision because it will have your name on it and there'll be an addendum on the side that will identify all the witnesses and the student involved. All hearing officer decisions are issued within 75 days of the date of hearing unless there's been a change to the timeline. And again, the change of the timeline could be to shorten it if the resolution time period was shortened. It can also be to elongate it if there's been an amendment that has elongated the time period or if the parties have agreed to do a continuance um, to allow, for example, for written closings. Um, the hearing officer decision is going to outline facts. It's going to outline the issues. It's going to outline whether you, as the petitioner, have met your burden of proof. Uh, it's going to outline whether, if you've met your burden of proof, whether any remedy is required, and if so, what that remedy is due to the, to the petitioner. Um, you want to make sure that you review this decision with your client. So you want to read it to yourself first, and then you want to make sure to review it with your client afterwards to ensure that your client understands exactly what that hearing officer decision says and what it means for them. You may also, after the hearing officer decision has been issued, even if you've prevailed, you may be required to help implement the remedies that are outlined in that hearing officer decision. Um, and we can help you with that. So for example, the, your client may be awarded tutoring and you may not know where to look for a tutor and the school system may have offered tutors that don't seem reputable or do not seem to be able to meet your client's child's needs. 
Uh, you can always reach out to your CLC mentor um, or other folks in your office who may have handled cases with us in order to find out who might be able to implement that and how you can move that process along. You also may be in contact with the school if, for example, you've argued for a new placement and you've won on that placement issue. You may be the one communicating with the placement just to let them know that, ha that you have prevailed so that they know to get ready to get the child um, into their classes and into their schedules. You may also need to deal with issues of transportation in terms of getting the child to, for example, therapy if transportation has been awarded or getting the child to a new placement. That ends this section about litigating. Thank you so much again for considering taking a case with us. We look forward to working with you. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to CLC or any of our mentors. Thanks.